the fun thing about occasionally identifying as an artist is that it can excuse a lot. Want to make something weird? Call it art. People still might not like it, but at least they'll have a mental box they can put it in, and sometimes that's enough, even for yourself. For instance, I've long had a dream of making a little arcade of unfun video games. I'm not sure why, something about the idea just tickles my brain in a way I can only describe as, it'll be art, I guess. I've got a whole list of ideas, from a light gun shooter, where the plastic gun is a musket that has to be reloaded properly between each shot, to a street racer set in realistic metropolitan traffic. But they would all require significant effort that I've never quite found the motivation for. Last January, though, I had another idea which had two important things going in its favor. First, it would require far less programming effort than some of the other ideas. And, possibly more importantly, a friend said he'd take it off of me when I was done. The idea? Asteroids, but now the asteroids can hit each other. Asteroids, but with conservation of mass. Asteroids, but with basic Newtonian physics. Asteroids, Kessler Syndrome Edition. In 1982, Popular Science published a rather dramatically illustrated article called The Growing Peril of Space Debris. This popularized the work of several scientists, including Donald Kessler, who had suggested that the generation of debris in orbit would follow an exponential curve. The more junk in low Earth orbit, the more likely it is to collide with other stuff, generating yet more debris, which would then go on to generate even more, and so on and so on. In its ultimate form, this could result in so much space trash that low Earth orbit becomes more or less unusable, as any satellite or spacecraft operating there would need an impractical level of shielding just to survive. This possibility, commonly called the Kessler Syndrome, was dramatized to great effect in the movie Gravity, though on an unrealistically accelerated timeline. In reality, it would take decades, but it might already have started. Russia, and the Soviet Union before it, as well as the United States, China, and India, have all tested anti-satellite missiles, destroying actual satellites in orbit. Luckily, they have only targeted their own satellites for these tests, so far, but each test creates a large cloud of high-velocity debris moving out at unpredictable vectors. In 2009, we saw our first true collision of two satellites, Iridium-33 and our Russian Cosmos, an ominous event that, of course, only added to the problem. All of this is compounded by the fact that a third of all satellites ever put into orbit around the Earth have been launched over the last five years. We're putting a lot more stuff up there. So does this mean a Kessler Syndrome is inevitable? No clue. Ask me again in 2050 or so, I'll probably still be around. But it's definitely an interesting idea, and I do so love interesting ideas. So let's break a classic video game by implementing it. For those who haven't played it, Asteroids is a 1979 arcade game, originally implemented on a gorgeous vector display, where you fly a little triangle around and shoot the eponymous asteroids, breaking them apart. Once they get small enough, shooting them makes them disappear. They come in waves, more and more each time, and your goal is to survive as long as possible. It has a two-player mode, but only in the taking turn sense, not actual simultaneous play. The playing field is an unmoving rectangle of space, which wraps around from top to bottom and left to right. Topologically, this means you're playing on a torus, which I always find surprising to remember. It seems like that should be far harder to implement. Anyway, it's an absolute classic. The software side of things was done over a few weeks last January, starting with a Python version I found that looked like it would be easy to get running on a Pi to install in the cabinet. Eventually, this involved rewriting more or less the entire thing with a real object hierarchy, because now everything can collide with everything. I probably should have just implemented it from scratch, but oh well. The big change was letting asteroids hit other asteroids, and also not having them go away once the exploded chunks are small enough. Instead, you can blast them down to little sand grains, but shooting those any further doesn't change anything. At least at this level of simulation, Kessler was absolutely right. The chain reaction goes exponential very quickly once you let things start hitting each other. Not only do the asteroids stick around forever, so do your bullets, instead of disappearing after a given period of time like in the original. Death itself can't release you from this fact. Even the spinning panels of your exploded ship stick around now. Mass, after all, doesn't just disappear because it's convenient to gameplay or required to run on the limiting processing power of late 1970s arcade hardware. Originally, your score was based on how many asteroids you had shot. That seemed unfair and counterproductive in a world where shooting asteroids is absolutely something to be avoided. 
so I replaced the score with a simple timer. Your score is how long you survive, nothing more. I did start to feel a little bit bad, though, that there wasn't even the goal of surviving individual waves of asteroids anymore. I mean, the game always was just about surviving as long as possible, with death something to be postponed but not avoided. But it sure is nice to at least pretend that our day-to-day -day activities aren't overshadowed by that inevitability, and that meaning is something that can be found or at least created in a world where everything is transient and impermanent. So I thought it would be nice to add at least the possibility of a real win state. A distant, maybe even illusory possibility, but it's the thought that counts. So I added a repulsor beam option, allowing the trajectory of the asteroids to be modified by the players without making the Kessler situation worse. Of course, equal and opposite forces, so your ship gets pushed backwards as you repulse an asteroid. And the larger the asteroids, the less delta V will be affected. It's pretty tricky to use, but this never was a well-balanced game to begin with. And with some Newtonian physics added, I really needed to add some equal and opposite to the shooting mechanism. Those are physical bullets being fired, after all, so the ship has to experience some recoil. I also threw in a real two-player mode with simultaneous play. PvP is implicit, obviously, since everything can collide with everything. And in case you think I was making some subtle political point about people being too busy shooting at each other to deal with the potentially fatal degradation they're causing to their environment, no, definitely not. Pew pew pew! And that was basically it. Now I was committed to actually doing the hard part, the cabinet. Most of this could be fairly freeform, but the profile of the side panels had to be right. About a year previously, I had bought a big old wide format printer off Craigslist, which had been sitting in the garage ever since. This project finally gave me the motivation to get it working, and soon I had the template printed, based on a DXF file I found on someone's blog. With this cut out, I could compare it to the vinyl side panel art I had bought, as one last sanity check that the profile at least matched the classic art. And it did. Not being particularly great at woodworking, I wanted to take advantage of this opportunity to try out some techniques that I'd seen in video, such as template following using a hand router. So the first thing I did was pick up a cheap sheet of hardboard, and once again I was glad that my minivan has more bed capacity than most modern pickups. And better yet, with the trailer I'm setting up for the kayak project, I should soon be able to pick up loads like this using just my cargo bike, so that's going to be fun. With the hardboard in the shop, I traced the template onto it and cut it out. I used the palm sander to finesse the curves and bring them right down to the inner edge of the guideline. I tested the flesh trimming on a piece of scrap first, to make sure it worked like I thought it did. This also let me dial in the depth setting on the router properly. I first rough cut the plywood panels to size, then used a flesh trim bit in the hand router to do the fine detail work. And it worked really well for the most part. I did have a couple problems with the bearing on the router bit sort of digging into the hardboard and messing things up. I'd seen some recommendations not to use flush trim bits on templates this thin, and that definitely seems like good advice. On the other hand, the mistakes weren't that bad, and hardboard is so much cheaper than real plywood, so it might be worth it to you to take the risk. In any case, I was able to fill in the wayward gouges with filler and sand it all neat and clean. I then used the first side panel as the template for the second to make sure everything matched, and that went much smoother. At this point, I got distracted with the microencabulator and Geochron projects. But soon it was May, with open source rapidly approaching, so I dove back in. My goal was just to have something presentable. It didn't have to be finished, it just shouldn't be embarrassing to show off. And here I ran into the real problem at the core of this project. Making an arcade cabinet is just that. It's cabinet making. That's like the highest and most terrible form of woodworking there is. Ages ago, I took a hand scraping class, learning the techniques for making perfectly flat surfaces for machine tools. At some point, the instructor mentioned a tool that would be useful to have. They were hard to find now, he said, but that's okay because we're machinists and we can make everything if need be. Pause. Well, except cabinets because we make them too precise and then the humidity changes and the doors swell shut. Yeah, there's a lot of truth to that. First I needed more plywood for all the panels, and this time I could have them cut it down at the store so I could move it on the cargo bike without even needing that trailer. My approach was to screw rails onto the side panels, onto which the various other bits would then be screwed in turn. I later cut several feet of dowels into little nubs that could be used to plug these countersunk holes. It was a bit messy at first, but I eventually figured it out. Finally, I trimmed them all flush with a pole saw. It worked pretty well, and I only sliced my hand open twice. 
This was the same all around, except for the bottom plate, which had casters mounted to make moving the final cabinet easier. As open source approached, I began to have hope I could actually have the whole thing done, except for maybe not having the screen mounted cleanly with the fancy graphics wrapped around it and everything, and the back probably wouldn't be super polished, but it would be close. The control panel was done with an EG Starts USB arcade button kit, which worked beautifully well. There are a lot of really nice off-the-shelf parts for homemade cabinet builds these days. I made a temporary mounting for the buttons so I could integrate it with the code at home. It really was just plug and play. Just a bit of extra code to add the button events as well as the old keyboard listener, and it worked. Another simple solution was this injection molded light up coin box for the front of the cabinet. I had looked at buying one off eBay, but those actually cost more, plus they tended to be incomplete and really banged up. So I embraced the superficial and went with the easy solution. The control panel and monitor shelf were beveled so they could meet cleanly. As a last minute addition, I hinged the control panel so the button wiring would be easier to get to. This meant cutting in a recess for the hinge, which I ended up doing on the belt sander. Actually it worked quite well. Since I wasn't quite sure where everything would end up until it was actually mounted, flying blind without real plans like I was, I couldn't round over the edges of the control panel and the apron ahead of time. But with a coarse grit sanding disc and an angle grinder and the palm sander, it was surprisingly easy to get a good result doing it in situ. I definitely wanted the edges to have that plastic bumper strip to make it really feel like an arcade cabinet. Turns out that stuff is called T-molding, and you cut the groove with a router bit like this. Painting was mostly uneventful, it just took forever. As always happens when painting something with interior volume, it took way more paint than I was expecting. And there was a bit of rain at the end, but luckily the paint had already dried. Cutting it possibly a bit more closely than was rational, I finally got the graphics for the control panel and the marquee printed on vinyl sheet just two days before I left for San Francisco. Adding the new text to the classic marquee graphic was a fun challenge, though. I ended up using Helvetica Noia Heavy for the typeface, which maybe wasn't 100% correct, but it was quite close. I merged a couple letters together here and there to match the original feel. The background graphics for the buttons is called the Control Panel Overlay, or CPO, and I ended up having to design my own. You can find images of the real thing online, but no real Asteroids cabinet ever had dual player controls, or a repulsor beam button, or as it ended up being called, the Antigrav Beam, so the text could fit. With the graphics printed and ready, I could spend my last full day in Seattle getting everything finished. The CPO matched the holes I had already drilled, luckily. For the marquee, I made a frame with rounded edges to hold it. I then cut a piece of acrylic for the marquee and attached it in its frame. The vinyl I had been able to get printed in time was too opaque to let light shine through, but I could live with that for now. Attaching the side panel art was nerve-wracking, but went pretty well. It seemed best to do it horizontally, so first I tipped the cabinet over onto some yoga mats to not mess up the surface. Then it was a matter of carefully aligning and clamping the vinyl in place, then peeling off the adhesive cover and working out as many air bubbles as possible. This was semi-permeable vinyl though, so smaller bubbles went away over time. This process would probably be a lot easier if you got someone to help. I trimmed the vinyl with a utility blade, then added the T-molding while the cabinet was still on its side and I had easy access all around it. Other than an area where I had let the router twist a bit and cut the slot too wide, it seated with some blows from a dead blow hammer just fine, even around the tighter curves. And it was done. Done enough for open sauce, at least. The monitor is just sitting there, but even with that I was surprised at how complete it felt. But maybe that was the Stockholm Syndrome talking. Open sauce was a blast, and while the cabinet got some attention, it wasn't the overwhelming draw that the D10 spinner was. Possibly because it looked too much like a normal cabinet. It also had some persistent and annoying crashes, which hadn't made themselves obvious when I'd been playtesting it by myself. I took the Pi back to the hotel for the first night and used the room's TV as a monitor. It had been a long, long time since I'd done any frantic hotel room hacking, and it felt great. Didn't actually solve the problem, though. The next day, when I had ducked out to go see Adam Savage's talk, someone about 12 years old came by and was so annoyed with this situation that they wrote a bash script to at least restart the process automatically when it crashed. Which, hell yeah, the kids are alright. One thing I wasn't expecting was the number of people who actually played it without seeming to realize it wasn't the original Asteroids. This might be because knowledge of classic arcade games isn't actually as universal as it feels to me. But I also suspect it was in part because, let's be honest, Asteroids isn't actually a very good game.
at least by modern standards. It's frustrating and random, and has a terrible interface. It's possible it just wasn't a very good choice for my first unfun game, not actually being very fun to begin with. I'm still working on finishing it up so I can get it foisted off on the friend who said they'd take it, but that's just detail work like replacing the marquee with a properly translucent one for backlighting and adding some access panels in the back. I still like the idea of the larger project of a whole line of unfun games, but I am definitely buying a cabinet kit if I ever do this again. I decided I might as well get this video out so I can focus on other things though, such as, maybe, possibly, an even worse keyboard than the two-thirds. Roughly 12 times worse, I would say. But dear viewer, you'll just have to wait to the next video to find out about that one. Cheers.